The following program is a production of Truth for the World. The book of Job is designed to show, hey, number one, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have trials. Job had many trials. Then we find, we can learn about how he dealt with them. And we can also learn that uh, Jehovah God is uh, very much aware of what we're going through and he will be with us. Tonight, I want us to uh, take up our parable in uh, uh, chapter 26. Now, in chapter 26, of course, Bildad has just spoken his third and last time. Zophar has run out of soap, and so he, he will not speak again. But uh, here is uh, <coughs> Bildad speaking, and then chapter 26. In chapter 26, uh, Job answers Bildad, and he uh, kind of, in, in a use of a little uh, sarcasm, uh, says, uh, you fellas have really helped me. My, how you have helped him that is without power. In other words, they had not helped him. Uh, they had just piled on. In he, here he is in the ditch, in the bottom of the ditch of persecution and trial and heartache. And uh, they just pile on and accuse him falsely and accuse his sons falsely, his children falsely, and of course said that they were killed as a result of their sin, and Job is dying because of his, and uh, that he has brought this upon himself. Of course, Job knew that he had. Now, Job is, uh, uh, you know, he wonders, how in the world can, can God do this to me? He thinks God is doing it. And so he questions God. He wants to talk to God. He, he wants to plead his case before God. And he cannot understand how God can allow this to happen to him, okay? And so uh, he, he wonders about God's justice in this matter. How can God be just and allow this to come upon me? And so, uh, and yet he honors God. He loves God. And he, he, he has questions about uh, uh, why this is happening. He can't figure it out. But yet he praises Jehovah God. I want you to notice, for instance, in chapter 26 and verse 7, and here is a pre-scientific statement. And the book of Job is full of pre-scientific statements. But here Job says that uh, Sheol is naked before God, a bad and hath no covering. Notice verse 7. He, God, stretcheth out the north over empty space. Well, of course, the scientists tell us that there's an empty place in the north. Now, notice the next statement. And hangeth the earth upon nothing. In other words, this is the law of universal gravitation. Long before man has realized that uh, the earth is hanging upon nothing, the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, uh, written, uh, in, I have no doubt, before uh, the time of Abraham. He, here is uh, the book of Job uh, 4,000 years ago saying that God hangs the earth upon nothing. All right? Now, how did God bring this about? Well, notice verse 13. By His Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, the heavens are garnished. The ha His hand hath pierced the swift serpent. That's a consolation. Constellation. And uh, Job uh, names, as we noticed last evening, some of the constellations. In Psalm uh, 104, uh, verse 30, the psalmist said, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. All right? And, and Job is determined that he's not going to turn his back on God. Notice chapter 20, 27. And verse uh, 4, Surely my lips shall not speak unrighteousness, neither shall my tongue utter deceit. Far, but far be it from me that I should justify you fellows, 
uh, his friends, uh, he wouldn't justify them because they had spoken evil concerning him, and God would later on say that they had spoken things that are wrong, false charges against uh, uh, Jehovah God. And so he wants to teach them concerning the hand of the Almighty, uh, verse 11. Now, I want to, us to notice uh, chapter 28. We learn many things in chapter 28, but one of the main things is that we can receive true wisdom only from Jehovah God. I want you to notice that uh, Job knew about mining back there. He says there's a mine for silver, a place for gold when they refine. In other words, uh, they turn, man is so ingenious, he turns the world, the earth upside down, the crust of the earth, and he empties it out, looking for gold and silver and iron and uh, copper. And there's no end to the extent that he will uh, go. He opens mine shafts, verse 4. Men go down into these uh, mine shafts, uh, to get gold and silver and iron and so forth, and they go f- so far back until they're even forgotten uh, that they are uh, uh, th- that they exist, that they're in there. In addition to that, he says, they go from one level to another. They swing on rope from one level uh, to another, and uh, they'll overturn the crust of the earth in order to get the dust of the uh, gold. And in fact, uh, verse 7 says, no bird of prey goes in there. Uh, The proud beasts, they don't go that far back into the ground. The fierce lion uh, does not go back there. And so he overturns the mountains by the roots, verse 9. He cuts out channels in the rocks. And if the streams break through, verse 11, well, uh, they just stop up the streams or go in a different direction because they're going to get the gold, all right? Now, there have been three rounds of speeches, three cycles of speeches with uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and Job answering those speeches. But what, what have they done? Well, they haven't come with true wisdom. As ingenious as man is, he depends upon God for true wisdom. Now notice verse 12. Where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. You can't go to a university. You can't go to a guru on the tallest mountain sitting in a cave up there or someplace else to receive fine, true wisdom. It has to come from Jehovah God. You can't uh, go to the sea and say, uh, give me true wisdom. You can't go up into the heavens and say, or to the ends of the earth and say, I want true wisdom, okay? You can't weigh out enough gold and silver and precious stones in order to buy true wisdom, okay? uh, Gold and glass cannot equal it, verse uh, 17. And notice why. Verse 21, uh, 20, Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the birds of the heavens. They don't know wisdom. Destruction and death say, We have heard a rumor of it with our ears, but we can't tell you what true wisdom is. And so where must you go to get true wisdom? If we're hunting true wisdom today, if we want to know what wisdom truly is, if we want to know the only philosophy that is correct, the love love of wisdom, then we're going to have to turn to God. Notice verse 23. God understandeth the way of wisdom, the way thereof. He knoweth the place thereof. For he looks to the ends of the earth, he, he seeth under the whole heaven. In other words, God sees throughout the universe because God created the universe. Uh, He he sees the wind. He he made the wind. He meteth out the waters by measure. He made the decree for the rain and the way of the lightning of the thunder. Then Then did he see wisdom 
and declare it, verse 27, he established it, yea, and searched it out. Now, how do we get true wisdom? How do we get it? Verse 28. Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. That reminds me of the description of Job. Perfect and upright, fears God and turns away from evil. And so God had directed his life throughout his life, had he not. All right. Now in chapter 29, he remembers uh, the uh, God as in the former time. But in chapter 30, he has been uh, so grievously persecuted and uh, mistreated. And uh, mistreated by uh, the, the, the fellows who were rabble-rousers, troublemakers, uh, whom he would not even allow to, to sleep with his sheepdogs. Verse 1 of chapter 30. I want you to notice that uh, I am now become their song. I am a byword unto them. Verse 9. They abhor me. These, <coughs> these are uh, those uh, whom Job used to wouldn't even let sleep with his sheepdogs. Now they despise Job. They abhor me, he says. They stand aloof from me, and they spare not to spit in my face. And so it used to be that people looked up to him, and people wanted to befriend Job, and, and people wanted to hear his wisdom. Chapter 29. But chapter 30, now they're spitting in his face. It, do you know of someone else who was mistreated grievously and beaten and a, a crown of thorns was placed upon his head and they spat in his face? And so, uh, what has he done? He's lost heart. Notice uh, chapter 30, verse 16. Now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold upon me. In the night vision, season, my bones are pierced in me. By God's great force is my garment disfigured. He thinks that God has done it. Actually say, He bindeth me about as the collar of my coat. He has cast me into the mire. I am become like dust and ashes. I cry unto thee, God, and thou dost not answer me. I stand up, and thou gazest at me. Thou art turned to be cruel to me. With the might of thy hand, thou persecutest me. In other words, I receive the back of God's hand. Well, actually, it was Satan, but Job thinks it is God. But I'll tell you this, he's not going to turn his back on God, even if he kills him. Chapter. 30. In chapter 30, there is a wide-ranging oath of clearance on behalf of Job, or on the, the part of Job. Job as it is at the end of his rope. You know what he does? He ties a knot in the end of the rope, and he hangs on for dear life. And in uh, chapter 31, he challenges God to a debate. I want you to notice here, in verse 35, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Now, God won't listen to me. Remember that we said that God, if God were to listen to Job and talk to Job during this time, oh, oh Satan would have said, Hey, it, it hasn't even been a test. Because God has shown his concern. And Job thinks and, and, and knows that it is not God doing it. It is I who am doing it. And so that would take away the test. And so Job, not knowing that, he says, Lord, I want to challenge you to a debate. That's the only thing I know that's left. Lo, here is my signature. 
Let the Almighty answer me. In other words, he writes down what he has done or states what he has done and he states what he hasn't done and he says affirmative Job. And then he says negative and leaves a space for God to sign the negative. Lo, is my sig- here's my signature, let the all ans- uh, Almighty answer me. He, ha- he didn't even have the indictment. You know, in this country, if you're arrested, they have a certain length of time, hours, before they have to give the indictment, right? Or they can't hold you. All right? That's part of the freedoms of this country. And so here's Job. For months he has been suffered. Suffering, and he doesn't even know the indictment. What am I accused of? And so at the end of his rope, he says, If I just knew the indictment, what the charge is, oh, I'd carry it around on my shoulder. I would bind it upon, uh, unto me as a crown. I would declare unto him the number of my steps. As a prince, would I go near unto him? I'd be so proud of it. But God won't talk to him. I want you to notice some things that Job affirms that he did and he didn't do. Notice that he did not lust upon an unmarried woman. Notice verse 1. I have made a covenant with mine eyes. How then should I look upon a virgin? That's the word uh, bethula, which means a woman who has never known a man. I made a covenant with mine eyes, an agreement with mine eyes, that I would not lust after a virgin. Why? Why? Well, if I had done that, then it would be disaster to the workers of iniquity. Does not God see my ways and number all my steps, verse 4? Then in the second place, he says, If I have walked with falsehood, I didn't listen to falsehood, I didn't carry falsehood, I haven't tried to deceive anybody, verse 5. Now let me be weighed in an even way, uh, balance that God God may may know know my integrity. I didn't turn out of the way. My heart has not walked after mine own eyes to take things that did not belong to me. If I had done that, then let another person sow, and let me sow and another person eat. Let the other person take over what I've had. That's what I deserve. But I didn't do it. Notice verse 8 and 9. If my heart... Boy, it's interesting to look at the heart in the book of Job. Job's heart. If my heart hath been enticed unto a married woman, and I have laid wait at my neighbor's house till he leaves and goes to work, and then I go in and be with his wife, then let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down unto her. I deserve that others mistreat my wife. If I commit adultery, but I have done it. For that were a heinous crime. It's not only criminal, he says, in the eyes of God, but it also is a heinous crime. Yea, it, it were iniquity to be punished by the judge. Then, then how did he treat, treat, mistreat, uh, how how did he treat his uh, servants? Well, well, if I despise, I despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when, when they contended, contended with me, when, when they, they had, had a problem with this or a problem with that, and I mistreat them, how can I thank God? What then shall I do when God rises up? When, when he, he visited, visited in judgment, judgment what, what shall, shall I answer, answer him? him? Did, Did not he that made me in the womb 
make him my servant? Did the same person not make him that made me? And then notice, you see, the friend had accused him of mistreating the poor, mistreating the orphan, keeping uh, the uh, widows from having what they needed and so forth. Job said, hey, if I have held, withheld the poor from their desire, here they were starving, if I didn't help them, if I have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or if I, if I have eaten my morsel by myself when others around me suffered, and the fatherless, the orphans, have not eaten their eye. Nay, from my youth he grew up, the fatherless, the orphan, with me as with a father. And her have I guided from my mother's womb. Widows, I took care of widows. If I have seen any perish for lack of clothing, I didn't furnish clothing for them. If the needy had no covering that I gave them, if the loins of the needy have not blessed me because of the the wool and the uh, clothing that I have provided them, if I have lifted up my hand against the fatherless and so forth, then he said, let my shoulder fall from my shoulder blade. Down in South Alabama where I was reared, we used to say, stick a needle in my eye. Let my shoulder fall from my shoulder blade and mine arm be broken from the bone. What did he do? He helped all these people. Job was an amazing person. Ah, he was so righteous. Notice verse 24. You know, they accused him of trusting in riches. He said, if I made gold my hope, if I said... To the fine gold, thou art my confidence. If I rejoice because my wealth was much, then I deserve what I've got. If I saw the sun when it was shining and I kissed my hand toward the sun, moon, and stars, if I practiced astrology, then that would have been to deny God who is above. Verse 28. If I rejoice at the destruction of them that hated me, and so forth. If the men of my tent have not said, who can find one person, verse 31, who hath not been filled with his meat. Whom is he not fed? Let him name even one. The sojourner hath not lodged in the street, the stranger coming through, I've opened my doors to the traveler. Isn't that amazing? Oh, you think about the example to Christians that Job the patriarch is. If I, like Adam, have covered my transgression. You, you know, I, Adam tried to hire, uh, hide his sin. Job said, I didn't try to hide my sins. I acknowledged them. I asked forgiveness and so forth. If I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, notice verse 39, taken from others and so forth. If I have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, then let the thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. The words of Job are in. Oh, I wish I had time to pursue that. I wish I had time to pursue the speeches of, of Elihu. Elihu's been a young fellow who's been sitting there the whole time, and finally after the older ones speak, he says, I have to speak. But his message to Job and his charges are basically the same, very similar to the others. He has four speeches, and then at the end of his speeches, the end of chapter 38, uh, 37, then God begins speaking in chapter 38. Job has been tested. 
He has proven his mettle. He has not turned his back on God. No matter what happened, he didn't turn his back on God. And it broke God's heart. There's no question but what it broke God's heart for Job to suffer like that. But God didn't have a choice. And so then he talks to Job. He answered Job out of the whirlwind, the same kind of whirlwind that killed Job's children, incidentally. And he said, Who is he that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Job had said some things. He had said some things in accusing God of not being just or, you know, uh, blessing the wicked but persecuting the righteous. He thought God was doing it. And he asked a bunch of questions. Now, it's interesting that God didn't add, answer a single question Job asked. And Job, de uh, God dealt with Job's questions, with questions. The greatest questioner that the world has ever known is the master teacher. God, Christ asked questions. And so God the Father to Job, Christ when he was here on earth, asks any number of questions, master teachers. And so we find that uh, he says to Job, Job, stand up on your own hind legs. Gird up your loins like a man because I'm going to ask you some questions and you are a human being and you're able to think and you're able to contemplate. And so I am going to challenge you by asking you some questions. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth For The World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here.